Growing up in Mumbai, India, I was always surrounded by family, aunts, uncles, cousins. I knew I could always go to my grand aunt, Faiba, and she would tell me stories. She was married at 13 and widowed at 16. And according to our customs, she had to spend the rest of her life wearing a colorless white sari. She could not remarry and she never really had a life of her own. One day, when I was around 11, I remember I bought her a cup of milk. And as she drank that glass of milk, I could see the empty look in her eyes. The very next day, she died. Something shifted for me that day. I realized that her entire life had been wasted, and I determined I would never let that happen to me. I didn't have too many people to share my feelings with, so I would write in my diary. I would go into my grandma's storeroom where there were these large steel bins of grains. I would sit on the white tiled floor, lean back against a bin, and write my heart out. The elders in the family, they were all worried about finances. That's when I realized that the person with financial independence is the person who has the power to make choices. The women in the family, my mom, my aunt, other women, they didn't have too many choices because they were all financially dependent on their husbands. But I wanted to be free. I determined I will never be financially dependent on anyone and I will always support myself. So, I relentlessly pursued a career. I went to college where my first job was writing for a newspaper. And then soon I was even modeling for top brands like De Beers. Around that time, I also started dating someone special. I had a lot of fun modeling meeting creative people, traveling all over India. And the best part is, I was making a lot of money, so I had a lot of freedom, and I didn't have to ask anyone for permission to do anything. At that time, Mumbai was coming of age. It was a bustling city, and I was in the midst of all of that. But I wanted more mental stimulation, so I decided to do my MBA in marketing, after which I got a job at J. Walter Thompson, an international advertising agency. And soon, I was working on their topmost client, Unilever. That was the best period of my life. At the time, I was still living with my parents, and my boyfriend at the time, he had uh, come to the US uh, to study for his MBA at Penn State University. And we had a beautiful bond, but we never really thought about getting married until our parents decided it's time. <laughs> so, Before we knew it, we had this huge wedding. Thousand people came, maybe more, and uh, you know, celebrations over three days. It was fun and food and laughter and dancing. And I had been growing my hair long for maybe a year, over a year, you know, to fit the ideal good girl bridal image. But the day after the wedding, I just chopped it all off till my ears. <laughs> because I wanted to be more true to myself, which is a bit more free-spirited and rebellious and adventurous. But my relatives, they were shocked. <laughs> and the very next day, we left for our life in the US. In the US, my husband had just graduated from college and he had got a job working on an H-1. An H-1 is a visa that you get when an employer sponsors you for a job. So as a spouse, I got an H-4 dependent spouse visa. And my husband had told me that on an H-4, you won't be able to work unless you get an H-1. I didn't think it was such a big deal because I was confident with my work experience and all my credentials. It shouldn't be that much of a problem. Besides, I thought this is America. This is the land of opportunity. So why should I be denied it? State College, Pennsylvania was very snowy very pretty and very quiet when we arrived there in March. 
it was a stark contrast from the hustle and bustle of Mumbai city, where I had to even fight to have an independent thought. Here, it was so slow and so quiet, with not a soul in sight, that I could even hear my every single thought. Soon, the loneliness of small-town America began to overshadow its novelty. I would go to the library and sit there all by myself, studying for my GMAT. Whole days passed. I saw no one, and I did nothing. At that time, there was no Facebook calling or WhatsApp calling, so calling India was very expensive. In that small town, there were no jobs for me. I would cook, I would clean, I would do housework, I wait for my husband to come home, which was the highlight of my day because he was bringing me this amazing cheesecake. <laughs> and I loved that cheesecake. I ate it every day, almost. <laughs> and then when it was time to go to India and try on all my clothes, I couldn't fit into any of my clothes. <laughs> and my relatives, you know, they all made fun of me, telling me how fat I'd become. A year later, we moved to New Jersey, and I was really excited because now we were minutes away from Manhattan, where there were a lot of multinational companies, and I could get a job. So I started applying to nonprofits, advertising agencies, in journalism, in modeling. I even paid to have my uh, academic records from India match the U.S. system here. I updated my resume, removed any references for visa sponsorships. Even then. I rarely ever got a single response. On weekends, we would go out partying with my high school friends, and the men, they all had jobs, and the women, they had come here on student visas, and they had got sponsorships, so they had jobs, and all they would do is talk about their jobs. Outwardly, I would put up a front, but inwardly, I was full of shame. I felt like an outsider, even amongst old friends. Monday morning, everyone we partied with, they would go to work, while I would sit alone in my apartment, staring out the window, feeling more alone than ever. The winter darkness was hard too. In our five-story brownstone apartment, it would get very cold. And I remember I would go from room to room with a space heater to keep myself warm. We had no washer dryer in the apartment, so I had to go, you know, a block and a half to the public laundromat, five stories down, five stories up, putting the clothes in a bag or carry them like Santa Claus. <laughs> and then sometimes I would be so frustrated I would just throw the bag down and kick it down the stairs. <laughs> so frustrated. And then my parents and my friends and my family, they would tell me, why are you so ungrateful? You're married into a good family. Your husband is making good money. You don't have to work. We would love to have your life and live like you in America. And I would feel so full of guilt. I would feel like I'm not a good person because I want more when I already have so much. I'd feel a sense of shame like I was a failure for wanting more out of life. Then one day, I found my dream job. It was a Madison Avenue job, and I met all the qualifications. And when it came to the question, the usual question on the applications, do you need sponsorship? I just left it blank, and I got an interview <laughs> for that job. So I dressed very professionally, very carefully, took the train to Manhattan, had a fantastic interview. And the interviewer looked at me, and she's like, excellent. I want to recommend you to the next level. But then I had to tell her, I need sponsorship. I told her, I'll pay for the lawyer's fees. I'll guide you through the entire process. But her face changed. I'm sorry, she said. We do not do sponsorships. It's a company policy. Somehow, I thanked her. I made my way out of that office, back to the train, to go home. 
I felt I had reached some kind of rock bottom. Here I was qualified and acknowledged to be qualified for the job that I most want, but I was powerless to get it. I thought about my grand aunt, the empty look on her eyes the day that she died. I had worked my whole life to not end up like her. And here I was exactly like her, empty of hope. I did not see any reason to continue living my life that way. There was a CVS pharmacy a few blocks from our apartment. I thought, I'm just going to get some pills and put an end to it all. Instead, I called some strangers. I called the suicide helpline. They talked me through it. They helped me understand the importance of my own needs. They helped me understand how my suicide would impact others. That evening, when my husband came home, I told him about the phone call. I told him, I want to be around friends. I want to be around family. I want to go back to India. And he was really supportive. I did not know if I wanted to stay married. I did not know if I wanted to come back to the US. So I went back to India and I stayed with my parents. My old company took me back. And it was so amazing to finally be able to use my brain, to be able to work, to have new friends. Then one day, on my colleague's computer, I saw these words. Nam, Myoho, Renge, Kyo. She told me that these words mean that we have the power in our life to overcome any difficulty we may face. And she introduced me to a worldwide Buddhist community called the Soka Gakkai International. And this community is the reason why I am alive today. They taught me that we all have sufferings in our life, which we call karma. But when we use our sufferings to help others, they become a source of strength and inspiration. So our karma becomes our mission. With their support, I found the courage to come back to the US and work things out with my husband. I also realized that I wanted to find my purpose in life, which was more than just getting a job. Gradually, I realized that my purpose is to tell my story, to help other women like me. Back in the US, I enrolled for a documentary filmmaking program at the New School in Manhattan where I made my first documentary, it's an autobiographical documentary called Heart Suspended, which broke the silence around the plight of dependent spouse visa holders. The film premiered in 2007 at the New York Indian Film Festival in Manhattan. I walked the red carpet, and then soon the press started reaching out to me, and then universities reached out and they included the film in their courses. But most importantly, so many women reached out to me, telling me about the abuse and the exploitation that they faced because of the restrictions of the H-4 visa. I was part of a group that met with members of Congress. We shared our stories, I showed them my film, and they told us that they were shocked to see how their policies were impacting people. Finally, in 2015, President Obama issued an executive order granting work authorization to thousands of dependent spouse visa holders. This was unprecedented, and I felt that all my years of suffering were not wasted. Today, I am an American citizen. I have found my voice, and I'm using it to tell my story, to help many others like me. Because all it takes is just one person speaking up.